He was a 21st century mechanized man. How he longed to grow his beard, tough and stubbly to the touch, but that was some years off and had to wait. I'll be back. Make my day. Reach for the skies. Words that formed a generation. The Western hero had it right, to a point. Being a loner, that was key. Alone on the frontier with no one to depend on and none depending on him. A drifter, a shadow, his horse beneath him with nothing but sky in all directions. He had seen those skies, Montana-esque on postcard racks as a boy. The revolving rack his mother warned him not to touch in the store. He had to reach high on his tippy toes to reach the really good cards, like golden eggs in a Strindberg dream. And are not our dreams the stuff we are made of? For in our dreams we can be anyone, free from the fetters of society's judgment. A woman can be a man in her dreams, a man, a woman, an hourly wage worker, bending their sweat at the mill is now the billionaire atop her penthouse, enjoying the view on those below. One day at the pharmacist, a card rack of dreams came crashing down on his head. No one noticed. Truth be told, no one noticed him come in in the first place. He had a way of blending into his surroundings. The store was almost empty of customers, and his mother was busying herself in the beauty aisle far away. Fortunate for him. No employees anywhere to scold him. Today he was a boy not much older than the children he would make the acquaintance of. He could see them in the back of his head revolving on that card rack. Pick me, oh me, no, no, me, pick me, why am I the one always last picked? Look at me, I'm over here, over here! His mind collapsing events, scents, and half-memories as the wheel turns. One leg was earth, solid and sure. His right arm was fire, consuming with heat. The other leg was a fox, clever, quick, and nimble, and his left arm held a bolt of lightning that he would let loose when opposed. That might prompt you to think that he was some kind of Norse mythology fan. He wasn't. Norse mythology bored him to tears. No, he was cut from the Judeo-Christian tradition. He didn't go to church any more. No one did. That's not the point. He was set solidly in his universe, knowing who he was and what he was about. He knew his business. He was about his father's business. In fact, he liked one particular story, the story of Abraham and Jacob. Now don't get all hot and bothered. This isn't going where you think it is. He had respect for the story of Abraham and Jacob. Where others found incomprehension and darkness, he found light. That was true of so many things in his life. Things that made perfect sense to him didn't make any sense whatsoever to other people. That's okay. He was gifted. And the gifted and talented often understand things that others don't. The understanding between his experience and that of others was a chasm as wide and deep as the Grand Canyon, magnificent in its isolation. He understood that death could be a sacrifice and an atonement at the same time. He met a girl once. He liked her, and she liked him. She even let him carry her heavy backpack home for her one day. I know that sounds corny, but she did, really and his heart leapt into his throat. He thought, golly, so this is how it happens. This is how a guy meets a girl. I didn't even have to try. She asked me. She asked me. But on the playground the next day, the guys teased him about that girl. And then the next day, they teased him again. And again. And again. So he gave up on the idea of that girl. Her price was too high. She probably didn't really like him in the first place. She just pretended she did so that she could laugh at him with her girlfriends. What prompts a young man to think murderous thoughts and then to act on them? Especially a former student who had sat in those same schoolroom chairs. I mean, all young men think about killing their father, their brother, their enemies on the playground, but it's the gifted ones who actually act on those thoughts. Or is the better question to ask, what prompts society to, to produce a boy like that? His mother was first. Well, it made sense to kill her first, because she was ultimately the one responsible for bringing him weeping and wailing into this veil. If not for her, he never would have been in such a predicament in the first place. It was her fault. That's why he shot her in the head not once, but four times. One for every element he held sacred. One bullet for being different. One bullet for loneliness. One bullet for being misunderstood. And one bullet for purposelessness. Why hadn't his mother loved him as he needed to be loved? Why hadn't she held him in the way he needed to be held? Why did she always smell of disinterest when he was in her presence? He was a sleepwalking killer his dream subconscious rising to the surface as unrecognizable as his childhood self, long ago misplaced and forgotten. That boy reaching for postcards, liking that girl, teased by the play playground boys. He used his mother's gun, a rifle. Her rifle first for her and then for them, a talisman for good luck and protection from evil. Where his mother fell short, her rifle would amend. The boy broke through a glass barrier, opened the front door and then strolled through the hallways and classrooms. He had an appointment with four- and five-year-olds. Do you remember being four? I do. 
I just learned to tie my shoes. What did you just learn when you were four? He shot the principal and four other staff members, the children's teacher. She was in the wrong place, wasn't she? Or the right place. She protected her babies. She paid with her life. Teacher turned protectress. A lioness guarding her young. As he walked the hallways, there was a narrow opening in his field of vision. He walked down darkened hallways, senses at a peak, ready to protect himself and his own. For these children were his own to protect. Protect from the disappointment sure to come their way. Disappointments had come his way. Disappointments as constant as the sun's rising and setting. Disappointments were sure to come their way as well. He was actually doing them a favor. Here was the place, the ground on which he had suffered, and here these children would have their suffering ended. A testament of blood to suffering childhood. Fortunately for the gunmen, and unfortunately for the victims, modern guns, especially semi-automatic ones, don't require the time and accuracy of prior battlefields. In the not-too-distant past, one had to use flint, powder, rod, and ball to accomplish anything of consequence on a battlefield which took, well, valuable time. By modern standards, an eternity. Modernity has its benefits. Battlefield, somewhat of a misnomer. To him it was more like a video game of hide-and-seek. You hide, and I'll try to find you. If I find and kill you, I earn points. The object being how many points can be earned in the shortest amount of time. The winner is the one with the most ki kills, hence the greatest number of points, and receives his reward in virtual reality. And after all, isn't that the most valuable kind? For virtual reality is eternal, never erased, playing on an eternal loop, over and over again. End part one.